Alrighty, so welcome in all the Welcome back to our uh, 2021 7 plus log Stevna, virtual Stevna. And these are our June presentations. If you missed this morning's session, we did record it. And we plan on putting that recording on the 7 log Stevna website. Uh, give us a few days, maybe a little bit longer to uh, get it up there. But uh, the morning session will be available on the Seven Log Stevna website eventually. Uh, I, I'm Jeff Husett. I'm the president of Telelogit of America. I'll be introducing uh, this afternoon's uh, Stevna session, as well as monitoring the Q&A box for your comments and your questions. And we're going to address those comments and questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, whoop, just a second. There we go move the slide. Uh, so today we're going to be, uh, we'll have a presentation on Scandinavian blacksmithing by uh, Doug Swenson. Uh, as you can see, we have sessions planned for July and August. Make sure that you uh, register for each session that you plan to attend, and you can go to the Seven Log Step website for more information about that. And now I'm going to turn the microphone over to Karen Olson, who is the president of Sigdal Log. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm very happy to um, present this afternoon's um, presentation for our Stevna. We have uh, Doug Swenson. He's from Holly, Minnesota. Holly is in uh, Clay County, just a little bit east of Fargo. Everybody knows about Fargo. Maybe not Holly. <laughs> Holly's also well known for Lefsa, by the way. So. <laughs> Um, so Doug Swenson's going to tell us about his working blacksmith shop in Holly. Uh, it's, he's been recreating the time period from about 1885 to 1910, and he has gained attention both national and international, and has appeared on the show America's Lost Vikings. He is working with researchers to help recreate tools from the late Viking Age based on archaeological finds from Scandinavia. So we think this presentation is going to give you a new insight to a craft that has gained new interest. So I present Doug Swenson. Thank you. Uh. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Uh, I hope that I can present some information that will be interesting for, for everyone. Um, yeah, blacksmithing has been a lifelong passion of mine. I started experimenting in a shop uh, on our farm as just a young fellow, a young boy, and it kind of went from there. And uh, it has, like I say, become a, a lifelong pursuit. Uh, as uh, was just said, the working shop that I have at my farm currently reproduces the time period of about 1885 to 1910. And uh, the reason for that period of time is that that was, you know, the period of time when the area that I live in, in Clay County in Gooseberry Township, that's the period of time where a great deal of settlement was taking place. Uh, we had many, many, many Scandinavians uh, coming to the area from Norway, Sweden, Finland in that area or in that, in that period of time. And so I, I wanted to kind of recreate some of those early days uh, of the blacksmith shop. So the shop is very typical of what would have been found in the smaller rural communities uh, from that period of time. And also even some of the larger farms would have had uh, very similar shops. Um, and so the thing to, I guess, start out with is that, so if we step back to the year 1900 and start doing some metalworking, uh, blacksmith work, the first thing you, that you would notice or that most people would notice is that it is tremendously obsolete, very antique compared to what we would expect to find in a working metal working shop or metal fabrication shop of today. Um, 
all of the tools uh, are very outdated, uh, the work techniques are outdated. But then if you consider stepping back another thousand years, another 1200 years to the Viking period, uh, the late Iron Age of Scandinavia, it is uh, just another massive leap in terms of uh, the technology and uh, really becomes quite, quite primitive. Um, I was fortunate enough four years ago to actually travel to Sweden under a Margaret Cargill grant and actually work with a couple of blacksmiths there who were highly skilled and extremely knowledgeable in the Viking period uh, as far as metalworking. And so I was able to learn uh, a tremendous amount of information from them, uh, information that I brought home and uh, that I have continued to develop and try and recreate uh, in my own shop um, as best as I can. And we do a lot of festivals and uh, reenactment events, that type of thing, where we actually set up what we feel is a fairly appropriate blacksmith shop from the Viking period. And I'll show you some pictures of that uh, shortly. Um, so what, what does the blacksmith do actually? What, uh, what is a blacksmith? Uh, well, we take raw material, usually iron uh, or steel today in the, our modern world. We heat it up with some kind of a, a heat source, usually a, a coal fire, a charcoal fire, or possibly modern day, uh, we would be using gas, a propane forge. Heat the material to a temperature where it is easily worked. We can take it to the anvil, we can hammer it, we can shape it, we can bend, twist, uh, do all sorts of uh, operations. We can weld it in the forge fire. I tend to be a tool maker first. So I tend to create or recreate a lot of tools uh, and most specifically from the Viking period. Uh, different things uh, that we would you know, work on. Uh, here's a, a little hammer that I have produced. Uh, this would be a very typical pattern from this period of time, uh, originals found in Norway and Sweden, Northern Russia. Uh, and of course, the material that we take out of the fire is extremely hot. It might be 1800 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. So we have to have a way to handle that material. Uh, and that gives rise to uh, tongs or basically big uh, pliers, I guess, if you will, of different uh, patterns, different designs based on what we're going to be hanging on to or trying to grip out of the fire. And these are a couple that I have reproduced also based on originals from the time of the Vikings. Uh, and we, when I talk about the Viking period, uh, it's, it's very arbitrary based on political events and socioeconomic events. So typically when we talk about the Viking Age, we're talking about, oh, the year 793 AD to about 1066. Uh, 793 marked the first um, well-known or well-documented raid that the Vikings made uh, on a a uh, monastery in England, the Lindisfarne Monastery. Uh, and that kind of signaled the start of a, a great um, expansion basically for the Scandinavians. Uh, they reached out to the, to the west, uh, to the east, uh, traveled widely, raiding, trading, settling, establishing cities. Uh, it was a very, very dynamic time. And then 1066 uh, is kind of considered to be the formal end of the Viking period. They lost uh, a significant battle uh, in England again, and were kind of driven out of the country. And by that period of time, things had changed uh, in the world, on the world stage, if you will. And um, 
many, many other things were, were coming into play at that point. So, so a relatively short time period and really quite arbitrary, but uh, a very dynamic period, uh, many, many things going on in those couple hundred years. Um, also, I reproduce uh, woodworking tools. This is a, a type of a, a small draw knife or a, a spoke shave, if you will, for shaping wooden items. The Scandinavians obviously were tremendous woodworkers. And uh, this with the curved blade uh, is extremely handy for working on bowls, let's say, if you were carving a, a wooden bowl for bread dough let's say, or even if you were working on large spoons, something like this with that curved blade is, is very, very efficient at shaping that. Uh, various carving tools, also uh, this little crooked knife would be fantastic for finishing spoons uh, as an example. Most of these, uh, or many of the items that I reproduce are from a site in Sweden, uh, this is a, a reference book that I use a great deal. It's about the master mirror, the master mirror find of Sweden. And it's very interesting. It was uh, a chest of tools that was plowed up in a farmer's field in um, about the year 1936, if I remember right. And it's dated to the late Viking period, so maybe the year 1000, perhaps. But it, it was quite unusual in that uh, it was a tool chest, and it had essentially a very, very complete set of, of blacksmith tools, uh, iron workers tools, hammers, tongs, uh, punches, chisels, uh, many different items. And that would have been a tremendous loss, you know, for someone in itself. Uh, this would have been a, a devastating loss during that period of time, given the, the effort that it would take to produce those tools and the cost. But also, even more unusual, was that it also contained a quite complete set of woodworkers' tools and uh, some other various, uh, assorted items, uh, some large bells that were, would have been associated with the early Christian church. So very unusual, you have found a, a chest with iron workers tools, with woodworkers tools, uh, bells, uh, you know, from the, uh, the church. Very, very unusual. And uh, it is proposed, several things have been proposed uh, that possibly uh, this fellow, this person was going across maybe a frozen bog or a frozen lake in the wintertime and his sled broke through the ice and uh, his tool chest was lost in, in that fashion. Or it has also been proposed that this may have been someone's uh, stash, that these were items that they really weren't supposed to have. Maybe they had uh, pilfered them from different locations, different places, and it was this was their hiding place. And for some reason, the person never got back to uh, to claim his uh, spoils, so to speak. But uh, it's very, very interesting. It gives us uh, a lot of good examples to to work from for reproductions, and uh, just the history of it. Uh, a person can you know kind of contemplate uh, just how this chest of uh, items ended up where it did for and sat for so long to be found so many, many years later. Um, I'm going to uh, shift now. Let's talk about a little bit uh, more specifically some of the, the forging from the Viking period. And I'm going to try and share a screen with you. I'm going to pull up some pictures if we can. Let's see here, there's that. Here we go. Okay, so you should see uh, a blade, uh, a knife blade on your screen. 
And I guess uh, this would be a very typical small blade from the Viking period. And I think one thing that's kind of unfortunate when we think about the Viking period, probably for most people, the thing that comes to mind is the raids and uh, the warriors and these uh, fellows with swords and battle axes and shields and spears. And, um, you know, that uh, those are the items that tend to get the most press, I think. But really, if you consider on an everyday basis, most of these people were, were farmers. Uh, it was an agricultural-based society. They had um, countless tools that they used on a, a daily basis uh, for their farming operations. And of course, something that would have been extremely important would have been small blades. Uh, you would have used this on your farm, on your fishing boat, uh, just nearly every aspect of daily life, uh, in your kitchen, meal preparation, just about anything. But what I would like to draw your attention to in this photo, uh, we'll talk about the materials that were used and some of the construction methods of these different items. You'll notice uh, the blade uh, on the bottom, the cutting, the cutting edge looks very smooth, it looks very homogenous and you see a much more layered appearance up above, uh, towards the top of the blade, uh, on the spine of the blade. And this is a, a function of two different materials being welded together in the forge at, at very high temperatures. The lower uh, <clears throat> cutting edge being a, a steel material, uh, an actual steel that was capable of being heat treated, of being hardened and tempered and would hold a very good cutting edge. Uh, up on top, we have another material, which is entirely different, uh, wrought iron, traditional wrought iron, which is a very layered material, very lamellar. And you can see, I think if you look closely, the, uh, the layers in that material. The, the steel, the homogenous steel was more difficult to produce. It was uh, a much more valuable material. So instead of producing an entire blade or an entire tool out of that single material as we would today, they tried to conserve their materials and they uh, welded uh, the two materials together to make a functional tool so that you had a very, very good cutting edge, but you saved the expense of that uh, more elite material where you didn't really require it. Um, so we see a lot of blades. This, this would be a very typical blade from the Viking period. And uh, this blade, I believe, if I remember right, was probably about three and a half to four inches long, possibly. Uh, let's see now, I'm gonna try and move on here. There we go. There we go. So this is another uh, small item. It's a small amulet, basically a good luck charm, if you will. And, uh, you know, beginning of the Viking period, uh, pagan religions were uh, uh, the uh, religion of the day, basically. So lots of beliefs in the traditional gods, uh, Thor, Odin, Freya, uh, that sort of thing. And this is a, a Thor's hammer, actually, representing the god Thor. Uh, he's well known for his uh, Mjolnir, his hammer. And this, again, is made from the traditional wrought iron material. You can see the layers in it uh, down in the hammerhead itself uh, that have been forged. And it's a, a very uh, fibrous material. You can almost see those fibrous uh, uh, portions up in the uh, stem or the handle and the little loop. And this is very typical. This is very typical of items that would be found in graves today when they, uh, the archaeologists go in and uh, explore these old burial locations. Uh, these amulets are very, very typical. And a lot of times what they did as well, they tended to take everyday items uh, maybe axes, spearheads, keys, 
um, different items, and then they would make miniatures of them, just kind of miniaturize them, and they would wear them basically as good luck charms, or possibly they were even status symbols uh, for some individuals as well. But uh, it gives us a very rich area as far as reproductions. Uh, these are fun, fun to reproduce and very popular with, with people. Um, and of course, weapons were uh, widely, are widely found by the archaeologists. This is an arrowhead. This would be for warfare. Uh, this particular one, not so much for hunting, but it's uh, very narrow, very pointed. This would have been used, it would have been very, very effective against chain mail, uh, a type of light armor. This particular one uh, is based on an original from Sweden, uh, a portion of southern Sweden. And what is unusual about this one is it's a little, you can't really tell from the photo, but it's triangular in cross section. So instead of being square in cross section or uh, flat, uh, I, uh, uh, flat section, this one is triangular and uh, a bit harder to forge, actually a fair bit harder to forge than a, a regular arrowhead. You have to use some special dies to create this but uh, it would have been a very fearsome, fearsome weapon. It would have been uh, very devastating to have been struck with, uh, with an item like this. Um, another little blade, uh, this one is a, a little fancier. There's some extra welding that has taken place in the forge. You can see the uh, kind of the little chevron pattern almost down in the cutting edge, and again, that layered uh, appearance to the wrought iron up above. Smaller blade, same construction. Very attractive. These are very attractive blades. One thing that I'll, I'll mention perhaps at this point too, there are obviously a lot of people that do knives today, uh, knife makers, uh, forge blades, but we take a lot for granted with our tools and equipment that we have. Uh, we have grinders, power grinders that uh, remove material very quickly. They grind and polish surfaces extremely, extremely rapidly. So back a thousand years ago, 1500 years ago, of course, we didn't have those items. We do have evidence of some very crude uh, circular stones, sharpening stones that would have been used during the late Viking period uh, that have been found by archeologists. But of course they would have been hand powered. You would have had someone turning the stone by hand. So still a very, very slow process. Um, most of the finishing would probably have been done actually with, with stones, with hand stones, such as this, which is from a, a quarry in Norway, where they have been harvesting, you know, this type of stone for thousands of years and uh, using it again to polish and finish blades, uh, weapons, axes, that type of thing. So very, very different <clears throat> in that respect. And also another thing, that we take for granted today are all of the heavy clamping tools, uh, the vices, the tools that we use to hold materials. Back uh, during this period of time, the uh, screw thread threads uh, hadn't been invented yet, so uh, it was very difficult or much more complicated to actually hold uh, something securely. And again, something that we just take for granted in our everyday lives today. It's another small little Mjolnir. Again, the, the wrought iron construction, beautiful material. Ah, so here I am in Sweden. This was four years ago, working with, again, what we feel to be um, a, a very appropriate or a, a very authentic 
forge uh, system that would have been used during this period of time. And you'll notice uh, the fireplace in front is uh, a mixture of clay and sand, usually with some type of fiber mixed into it, uh, maybe dry grass, hay, uh, even dried manure at some points, just to uh, give a little bit of porosity to the material that stands up uh, to the heat a little bit better. And the bellows that I'm using, you'll notice uh, two bellows mounted side by side. The large double chambered bellows that we usually associate with the blacksmith shop hadn't been invented yet during this period of time. So to get a steady blast of air, they had to mount two small bellows side by side and work them opposite of each other or opposed to each other. So when one was blowing air, the other one was uh, intaking air. And by alternating the two, you would get a, a very good steady blast of, of air through your fire. Uh, and you'll notice too, this is not large. Uh, it's a very small setup, but uh, highly effective. It's incredible the amount of work that can be done. The fuel would have been charcoal. The Scandinavian countries really don't have a coal supply to speak of. So they needed to go out into the woods, into the forest, cut timber, and then burn it down to charcoal and use the charcoal as their concentrated heat source. Uh, so any type of metal work or glass working uh, would have required uh, the charcoal. So already, you know, even before we start forging, we already have a lot of time and effort and, uh, you know, human, human uh, work time involved just to prepare the fuel that we will need to get our, our concentrated heat source. And you'll notice too, this is set up right on the ground. And we have evidence, uh, the archeologists have provided evidence that this was uh, very typical, especially in the early Viking period, that uh, most of this work was carried out right on the ground. And, and here you can see we're taking a heat with the forge, uh, the bellows are, are blowing. Uh, into the charcoal fire, producing a tremendously hot, hot fire. You can see the sparks uh, coming up, uh, being blown from the top of the fire. And in this photo, I'll direct your attention uh, to, the, to the back, uh, right at the junction where the bellows are blowing into the fire. You can see a, a round hole there uh, that glows. You can see a bit of the fire through that hole. And that piece of material right there is a, a material called soapstone. It's a, a type of stone that is found in Norway. It's quarried, has been quarried in Norway for thousands of years. It's also found in Greenland. It's a very soft material, easily worked, but it's highly, highly heat resistant. So you can heat it and cool it and heat it and cool it, and it doesn't crack or break apart like say uh, granite wood or sandstone something like that so it was an ideal uh, material for this application uh, it withstood the high heat uh, of the fire and was very very durable also you'll notice that the bellows uh, there are some small little snouts or spouts on each of the bellows in front these are metallic, these are copper. And you'll notice that they don't uh, directly connect with the uh, fire back. There's a space in there. And that actually works a little bit as a, a venturi effect so that as the bellows is blowing air through that uh, reduced uh, little spout, that's actually pulling extra air from the periphery of the, uh, the hole in the soapstone and actually basically injecting that into the fire. So you get a little extra, a little extra uh, oxygen going into the fire and it's a, the oxygen, oxygen of course that 
is combining with the charcoal that gives you the intense high, high temperatures. So, and uh, so this is maybe, I'm gonna say 15 inches to 16 inches um, lengthwise, uh, the, long, the long way. Uh, front to back, as far as the fire, maybe five to six inches, and maybe eight or nine inches deep. So uh, a very small, small concentrated fire. And here we are again. Uh, uh, my friend Lars uh, from Denmark was working the bellows. I'm tending the fire. Um, Again, working on the ground, you can see the anvil to my right. Uh, this would have been, um, the, the, the anvils that would have been used during the Viking period probably would not have been this large. As a general rule, this would have been quite a, quite a luxury to have an anvil of that size uh, during the period. Many of them were very, very small. Some of them uh, maybe two inches square across the face. Um, so this would have been a, an anvil probably from a little bit later period, uh, maybe early medieval. And there we're, I'm pounding out. Uh, I believe I was working on a small blade at the anvil. And one thing we of course work standing up. All of our work is done you know, we set up our workbenches at waist height, uh, that sort of thing. And so going to the ground and working on the ground was very, very awkward and really took some getting, getting used to. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if I still really um, grasp completely the, the reason of why, of why they were working on the ground. Um, Mechanically, from an ergonomic standpoint, uh, it seems like you have much better power, much better control in a standing position. But, uh, but again, this is what we, what we do have evidence for. So um, another question that obviously comes up. We, we have the charcoal, we have our heat source, but the thing that we have to wonder is, well, where does our raw material come from? Where does that iron come from originally? And um, the uh, process is, is uh, really quite interesting. It's not uh, complex, uh, it's a fairly simple process, but there's a lot of different ways a person can go wrong in the process. But uh, so in Northern Minnesota, we have a great deal of iron ore. This is a, a hard ore, it's, all, it's a rock material. You have to basically blast it almost, break it up uh, into smaller chunks that you can haul out. The Scandinavian countries have something that we know as bog iron or bog iron ore. And it's a, a process, uh, there's a natural biochemical process that occurs in these bogs, these shallow, shallow swamps, where iron is actually precipitated as an iron oxide and it forms layers in the bottoms of very shallow lakes and the bottoms of these swamps and bogs. And all a person has to do is to go out and scoop this material up and this becomes our raw material. And it's very soft, uh, very, very soft. Uh, I don't know if you can kind of see this. And it's almost like our clay material that we would have here very soft uh, and it's red of course because of the iron and let's see I think uh, I had a picture I'm going to try and go back let me see here if I can go back quickly yeah so here's a, a picture of a, a natural deposit of bog ore out in the swamp uh, in the bog in Sweden again it's a very soft material you go out uh, shovel it into a pail and bring it out to your, your work area. And to refine this, they would build a furnace, a small furnace of clay. 
and it would maybe be three feet tall, maybe 10 to 12 inches in diameter. They might load that furnace with, um, oh, maybe 80 to 100 pounds of the iron ore with a combination of charcoal. And the fire would be blown again with those bellows, the double bellows that we were just, just looking at. And uh, getting uh, an extremely high temperature with uh, a chemical reaction taking place, uh, the charcoal producing carbon monoxide, the carbon monoxide uh, combining with the iron oxide to reduce it to a pure state uh, of metallic iron. And so they would fire this furnace maybe five to six hours. Um, and then eventually they would end up with what we call a bloom. Let's see, hold that up, an iron bloom, which is, um, you know, hard to say, maybe 70 to, well, maybe even 80% iron at this point, but it has a lot of impurities in it. So if we take this, it comes out of the furnace, it's at a welding heat, it's a dazzling white color, uh, over 2000 degrees, and we would start to refine it. Uh, we would start to hammer it very gently, usually with wooden mallets. This is a, a very unusual material in that um, you can compress it and then it kind of springs back. You turn it a little bit, you compress it and it springs back. And the while you're doing that, you can see these impurities uh, kind of work their way out and they are just kind of falling out of the sides of the material. And there's another bloom that I have here. And, if you look closely at this one, you can see there are a lot of impurities. There's little bits of charcoal in it. There's uh, some clay from the sides of the furnace, probably. This all has to be worked out. Um, but so you work with this, hammering it, compressing, reheating, compressing, maybe for, oh, an hour, hour and a half. And finally, you end up with a small little bar of pretty much pure iron, such as this, that has been drawn out, it's folded over, it's been welded several times. But this then is the raw material that you can finally start forging with, that you can finally start blacksmithing with to forge your blades and tools and uh, that sort of thing. So again, a tremendous, tremendous amount of effort uh, invested in the process, making the material, making iron during this period of time extremely expensive and really quite rare. Um, let's see, let's go down. I'm just gonna click back down here. Okay, yeah, and so this is, uh, so when I was in Sweden, we actually went out and collected the bog ore. This is a little stream in the bog, running through the bog, and you'll notice uh, the bright red color from decaying vegetation in the swamp, and also, of course, the, the very, very high iron content in that water. This is a photo of an actual, uh, it's a base from one of the original furnaces that was used to reduce the ore in this area. And probably from the Viking period or just a little bit after the Viking period, but they feel that iron working has occurred in this area. They have mined the bog ore and reduced it to uh, a workable material probably for the last 2,500 years. So a very long, long duration process. And uh, it's interesting, uh, you can still go out to the bog in the same area and uh, collect the ore today and reproduce what they were doing 2,000 years ago. So, and another 
photo from a small stream. So oh, this is an area, this is the, uh, the home that I stayed in. I, I stayed uh, right with the families of the blacksmiths that I worked with. And this farm, they feel they have a record of it being an operating farm back uh, from the early 1500s. Uh, so it has been established uh, for a long, long, long time, a tremendously long history. This particular home had been uh, abandoned, I believe, in the early 1970s, and they were just renovating it at this point. And so you can see uh, some different uh, construction uh, details there uh, about their, their home. But it was a beautiful area, just a beautiful, beautiful area to be in. And uh, I enjoyed it tremendously. And uh, it was definitely a highlight of my uh, blacksmithing career, to say the least. Uh, let's see. Oh, these are some of the tools, uh, the actual tools from the Master Mirror Find, which are located in the National History Museum in Stockholm, Sweden. And it was uh, a tremendous experience to see these original artifacts and get to um, photograph them. Um, these are uh, some woodworking tools, some adzes on top, uh, and a couple of axes down below. This is kind of interesting, and I, I would like to, to talk a little bit about this uh, from an archaeology standpoint. So this is a, a burial, a burial mound from uh, central Sweden. And you can tell there are some horses down in the lower part of the screen. So you can tell the scale of this and the, the effort that went into producing this burial. So <clears throat> obviously this was not the average everyday farm person, farm worker. This was a very wealthy person, a very powerful person perhaps in the community with tremendous resources uh, that they would be able, his family or, or her family would be able to take the, uh, the time uh, to produce a, a mound of this size, go through the effort and of course, the grave goods that we find, uh, that archaeologists find in these uh, burials when they excavate, uh, range from everyday items to very decorative items, jewelry, uh, even silver and gold coins, uh, different times. But the thing that we have to remember is that the majority of the finds that we have, that we see in the museums, come from burials just like this. And so these being very wealthy people, they had the best uh, for the time. And it kind of skews our perception of what was actually uh, in use on a daily basis. Uh, obviously, um, you know, the finery that these individuals would have had, they would have been buried with, was probably worlds apart from what the average person working on his farm would have uh, used on a daily basis or what the fisherman would have used, uh, what his family would have used. So we <clears throat> kind of have to keep that in mind and uh, uh, kind of take with a grain of salt, I think, uh, the artifacts that we have in the museums uh, in terms of what uh, would have been in use for the uh, average person on an everyday basis. Um, oh, and uh, this is my last slide here. The uh, waterfront of old Stockholm, uh, looking back from the Baltic, the Baltic Sea, and just a beautiful, beautiful location, uh, very photogenic. And uh, again, just a tremendous experience being there. Let's see, I'm going to go back there. I think, I, I think uh, I'm back, I'm back here again. Uh, let me talk just a little bit. Uh, time is going by here pretty quickly. I, I hope I'm not uh, boring, boring people at this point. Let me go back and uh, talk about some of the basic forging 
uh, of one of these blades, uh, one of the blades that I, I just had up. So let's say we're going to start with our little bar of iron that we refined. And first step is we're going to, to uh, forge this um, flat, such as this. And then we're going to forge uh, a point out here, forge a little shoulder back here. And if you look at this, uh, this looks very close to a knife. Uh, it has the, the outline, cutting edge up to the point, the spine, and the handle then would go back this direction. But at this point, it becomes somewhat counterintuitive. And uh, many times, this is how forging is, is that we are going to actually turn it this way. And our cutting edge is going to be drawn out from this dimension. And as we do that, we're pulling this down, we're pulling this down. As we do that, this side is going to stretch. It's going to get longer and longer. And as it does that, it is going to have to curve upwards. So that actually, uh, when I'm done forging, my point that is right here, right now, is going to actually end up up here. Uh, so the next step uh, in doing that would look something like this. So I'm starting here to pull that cutting edge down. And I'm going to work down the length. This point is going to curve upwards. It's going to move upwards. And I will eventually end up with, with my blade, like this. Uh, this would be very typical of a Scandinavian blade, even to this day, where we have a very straight spine, very straight spine, and the cutting edge with a gradual upsweep to the point, and uh, wooden handles being attached back here. So um, it's, uh, you know, a very quick process. You can forge one of these little blades very, very quickly with a little bit of practice, but some of the steps almost, almost seem backwards at some points uh, from what we might expect. Okay, well, boy, time has gone very, very quickly here. Um, I think at this point, I would like to give it back and see, uh, hopefully there are some good, good uh, questions that we can discuss, things that we can talk about, uh, and uh, anything that I can clarify, I would be delighted to do that. Sure. Well, thank you very much. That was really, really interesting, Doug. Um, yeah, that was great. We do have a question uh, from Sandy Gilbert. She says, I see that you did not wear protective eye coverings. Is there any danger of iron uh, splitting off and hitting you? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Interesting question. Um, and, and yes, uh, the quick answer is there that, yeah, there's always a possibility that something can uh, split off, that something can glance and ricochet and, and come back and, uh, and injure you. And obviously uh, the eyes are very, very vulnerable. That's one thing that uh, is uh, a quite a difference. I think uh, here in our country, we tend to use a lot of protective equipment. We have safety glasses, uh, face shields, um, earplugs or hearing protection, you know, being used. In, uh, when I was in Sweden and I, I was working in, well, one shop in particular I spent some time in was very definitely a, a commercial shop, uh, a full-time blacksmith shop. They tend to be much, much more lax with their safety uh, concerns and the use of safety equipment. And, uh, and that's one thing, too, uh, another interesting aspect of that is when we go out and actually do reenactment, uh, let's say we're going to set up the Viking Forge and we're going to step back 1,200 years, 
you know, it's like, well, I'm dressed like a Viking and I'm working like a Viking with tools like a Viking. And, uh, you know, some people are going to say, well, if you put on safety glasses, it really wrecks, you know, ruins the ambiance of, of the whole experience. But, uh, but I, I am a, obviously a very firm believer. I want to stay as healthy as I can. Uh, I want to keep, uh, keep my eyesight intact. So, but there are definitely some differences, I think, from the States and uh, going over at least into Sweden. Mm -hmm. so. I see. Thank you. Uh, from Julian, it says, do you make uh, amulets like the first one you showed and sell them? And he's thinking of gifts to wear around the neck. Yeah, uh, I make uh, a lot, a lot of different patterns of amulets uh, based on originals uh, from the graves. And uh, they're fun to make, and they usually have an interesting story, you know, if you talk historically about them and uh, some of the religious beliefs during that period of time. Um, and, and actually, uh, it's interesting when we go out and do festivals, when we do reenactments, uh, those types of things usually are kind of our, our stock and trade. Uh, wow. Selling selling those items uh, kind of pays the bills, so to speak. So, yeah. sure. Here's a comment from uh, Carol Nowinski. She says, being female, I thought I'd be bored with blacksmithing. Quite the opposite. It was very interesting. And oh. I, I have to agree. Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm pleased. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of information that we just don't really think about. We don't consider. And uh, if you start to kind of look at it and dig into it, um, you know, hopefully, like I say, there are some interesting, interesting points and interesting aspects to it. Oh, yeah, so. Another question from uh, Jerry Uglund. Uh, is Scandinavian disregard for safety because they don't hold the employer as responsible for injuries as here? Is each individual essentially on their own with respect to the effect of injury? Hmm. You know, that's that's an interesting question. I, I would have to think about that just a little bit. Um, you know, and granted, the shops that I worked in, the one shop, uh, they were smaller shops. They were uh, in, you know, what we would consider to be an individually uh, owned and operated shop by our standards. But of course, uh, the government uh, is, it tends to be much more hands on, I think, in Scandinavian countries. Uh, so if I would have stepped into a, a larger shop, uh, a more formal shop, uh, it would have been interesting to have seen uh, if there were any differences that way. Um, I don't know. I don't know that I have a good answer for for that. Okay. Um, but but they, uh, you know, we have uh, a lot of individuals uh, that come over from Norway and Sweden, Denmark, to do some reenactment events uh, around the country during the uh, during the summer, and they all tend to be pretty relaxed and pretty uh, lenient that way as far as uh, safety. So, so it, it just seems to be uh, a trait, you know, for, for whatever reason. Okay. Uh, Sandy, uh, Sandra Beslin uh, asks, how widespread are the Vikings metal artifacts throughout Europe? Um, well, yeah, you know, obviously, <clears throat> uh, the Scandinavian countries, uh, there's tremendous uh, numbers of artifacts that have been found. It's a very rich uh, archaeologic record. But uh, going outwards, uh, of course, the, the Swedish uh, Vikings, the explorers, went into Russia, across Russia, basically into the Middle East. And there is a, a very, very good trail you know, of artifacts, uh, definitely Scandinavian, going all the way, you know, into the Middle East, uh, across Russia. And uh, of course, the uh, exploration to the, to the West, um, 
uh, into Greenland, Iceland, even the uh, northern north coast of North America. Yeah. And yes, uh, the, there are uh, large numbers, large numbers of, of Scandinavian artifacts that, uh, that have been recovered. Thank you. Another question from Sandy Gilbert. Um, have you found any ancient tools that you feel are superior to those in current usage? Mm. Um, I would have to say no. No. And that's a, that's an interesting question. And, and this is a discussion that we had actually when I was in Sweden and working on blades. And uh, so the, the, the skilled blacksmith that I was working with there, uh, who has also steady, studied many, many of the originals, his thought, his feeling was we could basically today take just about any material out of our scrap pile, you know, the, in the back of our, our shop, in the black, back of our blacksmith shop, forge a blade out of it, uh, finish it, sharpen it, put an edge on it. He felt that that blade would probably be better than 85 to 90% of the blades that would have been in use during the Viking period because our materials are, are superior, they're homogenous, um, they're much stronger. Um, and, I, and that's a, a little bit of a, you know, we have a little bit of a misconception about that. I think, again, getting back to kind of this uh, warrior culture of, um, you know, the blades and the axes. And, and we think that they had to have been superior. We think they were uh, tremendous tools. And obviously there were, I mean, there were some good tools and good blades made. But if you were to take our modern materials of today and make those same items, uh, they are, our uh, items would be far, far superior, far superior. So, but again, uh, it's a little bit of a, you know, misconception that we have, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's a comment from David. He says, I saw this personal responsibility issue uh, throughout all of Norway. Uh, Fewer fences have drop-offs, fewer warning signs. I wonder if the no-fault nature of health insurance is also part of this. It's very possible. Oh, very possible. You know, all of those things contribute uh, to our everyday activities and, uh, yeah, the day-to-day uh, -day workings of uh, life at home and, and also life in the factory. So it's very, very possible. Very possible. Uh, I've actually been teased by some of my Norwegian and Swedish uh, friends about the, uh, the the litigious nature of American culture. <laughs> we want right. to sue everybody. We, we want to make sure that you know everybody knows it's not our fault. It's yep. your fault, and yep. I'm going to yep. sue you. <laughs> Whereas they they see the opposite. They say no, you you need to take more personal responsibility. Yeah, you need to take care of yourself a little yeah, bit. Like if there's a cliff, yeah. try not to fall off of it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you know, we've I guess uh, come to think of it, we we have had the privilege of of doing some touring. Uh, we visited Ireland, and uh, Ireland, Dublin, of course, was uh, settled as a Viking settlement. But, um, you know, you can do things uh, in public places, uh, you know, monuments and different things, uh, you know, as far as, well, you're standing on a cliff, uh, you know, 500 feet above the sea. And if you want to, you can walk right to the edge and look, look over the edge. Uh, probably not a good idea. You shouldn't probably be doing that. Yeah. But if you really wanted to, nobody is going to stop you. Right. So, <laughs> the, the locals don't do it. So <laughs> no, no, no. But uh, the, the foolish, the foolish American, uh, you know, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> exactly. Uh, another question from uh, uh, Jerry Uglin. Uh, did you or the others do any welding? That is, joining one piece of metal to another, uh, uh, to, to one solid piece in some way? And if so, how? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's a very common, very common practice. Uh, again, most of the blades, uh, those composite blades, uh, the materials uh, start out as two separate, at least two separate pieces, and they're welded together in the fire. And it's a, it's a, a function of temperature. Obviously, you have to get the materials uh, hot enough where it's basically right under a, uh, a liquid state. Uh, you're not getting the material so hot that they're liquid and flowing, but right under it, uh, you know, maybe a couple hundred degrees uh, below that. And it's, it's called uh, solid state welding, where the material is just in a, a plastic enough state that if they're put together and uh, you apply some pressure, apply some force uh, by hammering on it, that those materials will actually join. And uh, in terms of welding the traditional wrought iron, <clears throat> that can be welded essentially perfectly. Uh, you end up with a perfect joint uh, as if it had never been welded in the first place. Uh, the wrought iron, tends to weld to higher carbon steels extremely well. So that would be, uh, you know, the case of welding the wrought iron to a piece of steel to form a, a blade where you get a cutting edge. Uh, that's a, a fantastic weld, very solid, very secure. Uh, the other thing uh, that comes into play is at that extreme temperature, that high, high temperature, if there's any oxygen present uh, from the air, the oxygen will combine with those hot uh, iron materials and uh, we say that the material oxidizes. It basically rusts at that high, high temperature. And the oxide, uh, the rust, does not weld. So if you get uh, the oxide forming between the two layers that you're trying to weld together, it is not going to weld, you're not going to be successful. So we have to protect against the, uh, the air or the oxygen. So we use something called a flux. And uh, in terms of the Scandinavians, uh, the Viking period, they would have used sand, just a, a good silica sand, a nice bright uh, white sand that basically melts at that temperature and flows and forms a layer of glass over the surfaces that you're welding. Then when you put those surfaces together, strike them with the hammer, that layer of glass that's in between goes flying out. Uh, you have these sparks uh, shooting out all over. Uh, but um, it uh, assures that your surfaces are clean and you have good uh, clean metal coming into contact with clean metal and it fuses very nicely. Uh, today with our modern materials, <clears throat> we would use uh, a borax based flux, basically uh, the same borax that you would use uh, in the laundry as a, as a detergent. And um, very effective, very effective at cleaning those metal surfaces at those temperatures, uh, allowing you to get a, a good, secure, solid weld. So um, the, the other thing is the speed. It has to be done quickly because you pull the material out of the fire. Uh, let's, say, let's say it's at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you pull it out into the air, set it on the cold or the relatively cold surface of the anvil, it cools off so quickly, so fast. You, you have a matter of seconds, you know, to get your hammer on it and uh, to make that weld. So, yeah. but, uh, but again, little, little practice and uh, just kind of following uh, kind of some basic principles. Uh, it's actually quite, quite easy to do and I do a great deal of it. Ah, I see. Uh, here one question for you too. Um, day to day, what what would a typical blacksmith do? I suppose it depends uh, uh, throughout whatever era. But um, like for instance, I, I, in my family history, I've got one uh, one ancestor who worked with a blacksmith to create uh, a metal 
jaw, basically. Uh, my ancestor was a, a, a folk doctor. And so a man came to him with multiple fractures in his jaw. And he worked with the, the blacksmith to create a, mm -hmm. a metal jaw that held the jaw in place for a number of months while it healed. And another example is from Sweden, actually. Uh, there's a town called Sture Huevi, and there's something called the Huevi Plow. And the farmers near uh, Sture Huevi worked with the blacksmiths to create this plow that would go through the, the very rocky soil. It, this is in Dalarna. And uh, it became quite, uh, uh, quite popular, and the, the Huevi Plow became kind of the, the standard plow back in the early, uh, early 1800s and late 1700s. But what would a typical day-to-day -day, uh, uh, sort of thing, uh, uh, what would a blacksmith do day-to-day, -day -day, I guess is what I'm getting at? What sort of tools and projects would they have? Yeah, that's a, that's a huge question. That's a huge <laughs> question, um, you know, because uh, there are many, many different aspects uh, to that. Um, during the Viking period, <clears throat> we know that uh, in the uh, Viking settlement of Birka in, in Sweden, uh, on the east coast, we know that uh, this was a population center that maybe had uh, 1,000 people, 1,200 people, something like that, uh, in the 700s, 800s. We know from what archaeologists have discovered, that they had two shops. They had two commercial blacksmith shops uh, in that community. They had one shop that was uh, evidently working on very general items, uh, everyday items, uh, you know, hinges for doors, uh, door latches, um, any items related to agriculture for uh, trace chains, you know, for hooking up horses and oxen and, and that type of thing. Any of those day-to-day uh, -day things. But there was a second shop that was highly, highly specialized, even at that point in time. And they were working on blades uh, and weapons, uh, axes, and also locks. Uh, making uh, early padlocks, basically, already at that point. So highly, highly specialized. And um, so that would have been, you know, the trade, the trade center or, you know, the, the Viking Age community. But in the smaller communities, the outlying areas, we have evidence that would indicate that most of these blacksmiths also doubled as farmers, basically. Uh, again, agriculture was the basis of, of everything. So you would have been in a situation where maybe a person would have worked in a shop, you know, several days, uh, kind of as uh, necessi necessity dictated uh, in terms of the work that came in, and, and then he would go out and work, you know, work his fields. Um, but I think, and from what you have said, uh, you know, in, with some of the things, many of these blacksmiths were very, very general in nature. You know, uh, if uh, they, if somebody had an idea for a new plow, let's say, or, you know, some type of a new tool or a new implement even, you know, maybe something, uh, an item that they would have used in the woods uh, in terms of cutting timber and harvesting timber. You know, they would have had <clears throat> the, the skills and the ability to go ahead and kind of experiment with that process and develop, you know, a work process to produce that new item, be it, uh, you know, a plow or uh, some kind of a special door latch for the barn or whatever whatever that was um and and i i think too you know again we think about we think about the weapons you know we maybe think about that specialized shop in burka and they're making uh you know blades and spears that would have been a very specialized type of work. There would not have been many individuals probably engaged, you know, in, in, that, uh, in that trade or that practice. Most of the blacksmiths would have been very, very general, very general. Okay, thanks. 
a uh, few more questions and comments here uh, from Mira. How long, let's see, how long would it take in those times to make a single item? I suppose it would depend upon what the item was. But. What it is, yeah. Um, y you know, I can do, I can forge uh, a blade. Mm -hmm. uh, I can do a composite welded blade myself in uh, less than an hour, you know, from the start of preparing materials to doing the welding to forging it to the correct shape and having it ready basically for final grinding. Uh, I can do that in, in less than an hour. Um, obviously, if you're working on something bigger, let's say you're working on an ax uh, where you're going to be welding larger pieces, doing some heavier forging to shape the item, you know, obviously it, it, it is going to take a little bit longer. But I, I think um, most people are quite surprised uh, if they are able to observe uh, a blacksmith that has uh, some skill and some experience, how quickly, how quickly they work. And I will say that was one thing that I noticed uh, drastically with myself when I visited Sweden and worked with these fellows. Uh, these are highly, highly skilled individuals. But um, that was the thing that really separated myself from, from them mm -hmm. was, you know, my, my feeling was that I could do the same work that they did. I, I could produce the same item. I could probably get uh, very close to the same quality of a finished product, but they would do it about three times faster than I could. They were incredibly fast compared to, to what I was used to, or, you know, so. Interesting, interesting. Extremely, extremely fast. Uh, here's a comment from Sandra Bestland. She says, in, uh, in 2015, my husband and I went to the UK. He was born in England. Mm -hmm. And we spent a day in Waterford in the Republic of Ireland. We were so mm -hmm. amazed that there, uh, that it was founded by Vikings. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. A thousand year old Viking building still stands. Yes, yes. Uh, and it, it's a tremendous experience, you know, to go and visit those sites and those locations uh, and, you know, walk in the same places that they walked, you know, a thousand years ago, 1200 years ago. Um, yeah, just a tremendous experience, tremendous experience. And, you know, many, many of our, well, quite major cities, uh, you know, York, England uh, was a Viking settlement. Dublin was a Viking settlement. Kiev, Russia was a Viking settlement. And, uh, you know, they, they had tremendous influence, Absolutely. tremendous influence during that period of time. Really got around. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And here's another question from Jerry Ugland. Uh, did the Scandinavians do any alloying? Uh, well, yeah, of course. Um, you know, the bronze, the bronze age uh, was a predecessor of the Iron Age. So bronze, you know, being uh, a mixture of uh, copper and tin, basically. And, um, you know, that, that um, technology was, was very well known. And actually, I, I do a little bit of bronze casting, actually, in my shop as well. Uh, and this... Um, I don't know if you can see, see this, I'll try this. Uh, these are a couple of little, little amulets. There's the Thor's hammer, but that is actually a bronze, a little bronze ax, little bronze ax head oh, that I uh, cast uh, in the shop using a, uh, a little uh, beeswax pattern uh, that I shaped with beeswax, made uh, a mold and then poured, uh, poured the bronze uh, into that for the ax. And we see, uh, yeah, during the Viking period, uh, many, many items, uh, many artifacts of bronze, of copper. And it's interesting that um, we find probably for every iron artifact that we find, we probably find close to 10 copper or bronze artifacts, simply because the bronze is uh, much, much more durable 
over time. Uh, the iron-based uh, items, they rust, they oxidize, they deteriorate, they fall apart. Uh, whereas the bronze uh, items are much, much more durable over time. So, and uh, yeah, there are some beautiful, beautiful items made from bronze. Uh, the casting of some of the uh, jewelry of some of the ornate items is just astounding. Uh, beautiful, beautiful work done during that period of time. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much. I, I, we're, we're out of our questions now. Um, this was fascinating. I really enjoyed yeah. it, Doug, so thank you so uh, much. Well, very thank you. Thank you again for, for allowing me to come and, uh, oh, and visit. You, you, and speak. you can come back anytime. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Doug. We certainly appreciate it. Oh. Yep, yep. Very good. Wonderful. Holy. Wonderful. My pleasure. My okay. pleasure. Yeah. And I, I should mention, too, oh, I hope uh, I hope to return to Sweden later this fall uh, if uh, travel restrictions lift. I'll be going over on a, a grant that I got from the American Scandinavian Foundation, and I'll be continuing my studies. Uh, I'll be looking specifically at uh, the impact of uh, the blacksmith and iron working on agriculture during uh, the Viking period. Uh, so, uh, so it's just a matter of time. Uh, we'll wait for the travel restrictions to lift, and, uh, and I'll be on my way. Mm -hmm. there, so. Excellent. Hope you get to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, very good. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, Oli. Yeah. You got any jokes today? Oh, I got one I might be able to tell. Okay. We'll see. Uh, Lars, he, a big Lars, he took his son, little Lars, to church for the first time. Before the service, they were sitting there, and little Lars was looking around, and he says to his papa, he says, Papa, he says, what are them uh, boards with the names on them on the wall for? And big Lars says, oh, them are for the people that died in the service. Little Lars says, which one, the 830 or the 945? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's your best one <laughs> so far. <laughs> okay. So everybody, you need to come back to the July session to hear the one that's going to be better than this one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you got a challenge there, Oli. <laughs> All right. I, I think I might be able to answer. Okay. Great. <laughs> Well, I, I believe that's all we have today. Uh, I hope to see you all back for our July sessions. Please go to the Seven Log Stevno website and make sure that you're registered for the July sessions. Um, and at this point, I think I'm going to stop the recording. Boom. If I can. Yes, I can. Yep.